What I want to speak about today is uh, ecology and economics, but before I do, in, in uh, the spirit of capitalism that we all adhere to here, I want to put in a commercial message, <laughs> and that is for the Fraser Institute. Uh, these blue cards are around somewhere. Uh, I think they're over there. If you fill one of these out, uh, we will make you a gift of a free subscription to the Fraser Forum, which is a monthly publication of the Fraser Institute and you'll get a four-month free subscription, so please fill it out. And if we run out of these cards, just give me your business card or put your name and address on a napkin or something, and we'll do it that way. We are coming out with a book in a few weeks called Ecology or Economics and the Environment, A Reconciliation. And I'll also send you some information about that book. I think it's no exaggeration to say that environmental problems are among the most important to Canadians nowadays. Certainly, the newspapers are uh, waxing eloquent about this problem. They talk about uh, oil spills and elephant extinction, greenhouse, ozone layer problems. Public opinion polls have indicated that the environment is one of the most pressing issues uh, on the minds of Canadians today. One instance of this is that uh, in the last year, CBC did 250-plus stories on the environment, whereas last year's Hot Topic only got 121 stories, namely the uh, Free Trade Agreement. We happen to know these with uh, this exactitude because the Fraser Institute has a media center which monitors CBC to see if they're balanced in their news coverage, and I'll give you one guess as to whether they are or not. <laughs> Many people see ecology or concern for the environment and economics as polar opposites. They see on the one hand economic growth and on the other hand preservation of the planet. And many people feel reasonably rich enough so that we can now afford to take care of the planet. My goal, however, is to reconcile these two or ultimately to plot a course where we can have our cake and eat it where we can continue on with economic growth on the one hand, and on the other hand, not wallow in garbage and engage in, you know, uh, polluting ourselves to death and ruining the planet. Now, this attempted reconciliation is impossible for some environmentalists. They just use ecology as a stick with which to beat the free enterprise system. One simple reply to them is that no matter how bad capitalism is with regard to the environment, socialism is worse. True, we've had Three Mile Island where no one died, and we've had Chernobyl where uh, many people died. And as bad as the environment is here, and I understand there are cases of lakes and rivers uh, catching fire, <laughs> it's much worse on the other side of the Iron Curtain. So if you're just using it as a political stick, then I think the cases with the free enterprise system, so-called, that we have here, however imperfect it is. But this re uh, reconciliation is also impossible for some ecologists, uh, for some right-wing people, some economists, some uh, libertarians, certainly for objectivists. They're concerned only with the immediate bottom line. Some of them joke about, well, we've got to pave over all greenery, you know, let not a, a tree live after we get through with it. One example of this, of course, is Ayn Rand, who said we should kiss the smokestacks. And it's, uh, that's what she said. We should kiss the smokestacks, and you know, the, the tip of the cigarette is sort of like a man's wife or ASA or something like that. I never could catch that, but she would say things. Ah, that's it, okay. The spark in his mind. Well, you know, uh, these are, as I see it, uh, invasive activities. They're uh, polluting, they're trans. they're crossing borders, they're engaging in violence against other people. So it's hardly compatible, at least the way I see it, with a true private property uh, system. However, there are many people of goodwill on both sides of this divide, and that's the attempt, that's the way we will attempt to engage a reconciliation. There are some people, hopefully, uh, with whom we can dialogue with on both sides. Now, the reconciliation that I'll be proposing, and that is proposed in this book, is that economic means, or means consistent with private property systems, can be used to attain environmental ends. And not only can economics be used for this purpose, but I will argue that economics is a better means toward the goal of saving the environment 
or the use of economics in private property is a better way of achieving environmental safety than are the means put forth by the Green Party, which is mainly greater government involvement in more regulation. I'm reminded in this regard of Roger Douglas. Roger Douglas is the head of the Labour government in New Zealand. This would be the equivalent, roughly, of our NDP, or maybe the left wing of the Liberal Party. And yet, things were so bad that when he got in, campaigning on a, the usual socialist, uh, social democratic policy, that what he did in New Zealand was he out-privatized Margaret Thatcher. It's really amazing, not many people know this, but it would be as if Dave Barrett got in here and started selling off Petrocan and privatizing the post office. I mean, it's a little hard to believe, but um, that's what happened in New Zealand. And then he was asked, well, how can you, an avowed socialist, uh, adopt such a program? And his answer deserves to be, uh, I don't know, maybe put in the next year's calendar or something like that. <laughs> maybe not. Uh, wait till you hear it. Uh, you'll decide for yourself. He says, well, I haven't given up on socialist ends, which are peace, prosperity, full employment, you know, all those good things. It's just that we're pursuing these ends with capitalist means. <laughs> well, <laughs> well, I mean, uh, I'm a socialist too, I suppose. <laughs> we're all socialists now, you know, because, uh, you know, the hell with the ends or the goals or the purposes. We want to know what you're doing. And if what you're doing is dismantling the state, well, uh, okay. I mean, if that's what socialism is, you know, where do we sign up? <laughs> so it is in this spirit that I offer my reconciliation. I am a greeno or a greenie or whatever. If by greeno I mean having green goals, that I'm going to use capitalist means to, toward attaining these goals. Many people will question this. They'll say, it seems like a paradox. Aren't economic growth and ecological soundness supposed to be enemies? Aren't they incompatible? All I can say at the outset is that there's no more of a contradiction in trying to use economic or private property means toward attaining environmental goals than there is toward using capitalist means for socialist goals. How can we explain the supposed enmity between economics and the environment, between capitalism and ecologists? Well, there are several groups that I would uh, put forth for our consideration. First, they're just innocent. You know, innocent people, they're, they're told that there's a contradiction, they're told long enough and loud enough by every hand, and they sort of believe it. Now, I have a 12-year-old boy and a 10-year-old girl who are in school, and this is all they hear. You know, when they do social studies, you know, they, they write letters about saving trees and loving trees, and, you know, sort of perverted, hug a tree, it's, you know. Uh, <laughs> They're just little children, and that's what they tell them. And they write letters to their MLAs about how we shouldn't uh, allow housing to be built because you'd have to knock down, God forbid, a tree, you know. Uh, and I think that there are lots of people like that. They really don't know any better. And my wife tells me to shut up and not tell my kids the truth because I'll get them in trouble. And, you know, the, their teachers won't like them. Their fellow students won't like them. They'll be the only one taking this view. So it's personally uh, difficult for me to accept this, but that's the difficulty of parenthood. Then there are the, uh, what I call the pinko greenos. <laughs> <laughs> These are the people that, I guess to borrow Ayn Rand's thinking, sort of have this death wish. They really want to commit suicide, but they don't want to go alone. They want to bring us all with them. And this sort of motivates their every political insight. And, you know, previously it was uh, central planning or indicative planning or whatever it was, uh, planned obsolescence. You know, they've got all sorts of great reasons why capitalism is no good and we have to have socialism. But somehow they're, they're sort of in disarray. I mean, look what's happening with the Soviet Union and perestroika and even China for a while. It looked as if it was going that route. And certainly Hungary, Czechoslovakia, Romania, East Germany, you know, they celebrated their 40th anniversary and people are trying to leave like rats from a sinking ship. <laughs> so, so they've got to come up with a new schema. You know, the, the, uh, the old lemonade stand stuff just ain't working. Marxism, I mean, the only Marxists nowadays, there are no Marxists behind the Iron Curtain anymore. They're, 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 only, they're all in universities in Canada, it seems, or maybe behind the pulpit in, in, uh, in Canada, the United States, and in, in Western Europe. That's where the Marxists are. So this, too, is going by the board, and, and, you know, if you have this death wish and it animates your every thought, you say, well, you know, we can't 
push the Marxism crap. We've got to go with something else. And happily, something else has come along for them, and that's the environment. That's why we need um, socialism. And it really wasn't for central planning. Yes, the market can plan, but it can't take care of the environment. It's the new pinko green old view. And then there's a third category, and these I call the radical tree lovers, the nature lovers, the human haters. You know, trees have rights, as many rights as people, more rights than people. You know, who, who do you think you are cutting down a tree? How would you like to be cut down? You know, that, that's the sort of, uh, uh, that's the sort of, uh, these are like not political ideological Marxists, but the, who are just adopting the environmental stuff as a facade, as a veneer. These are the true, you know, tree fetishists or grass fetishists or something. Now, uh, one person who's, who comes to mind as an example of this, I think, is uh, David Suzuki. I mean, he's been pushing this stuff for a long time, and uh, he's as good an example as I think we can have in Canada. However, there are some environmental people with all sorts of respected uh, ecological uh, credits to their name who take a very different view. And so there is hope even within the environmental group, people have just as good uh, environmental credentials as he. For example, Ducks Unlimited, Environmental Probe, and Nature Conservancy. What they do is they say, yes, we've got to save the ducks, we've got to save the geese, we've got to save these animals, the worms, whatever it is. So instead of asking the, the state to do something, they say, well, we'll collect money privately, we'll go out and buy some land, and we'll conserve. Well, I mean, this is perfectly legitimate from our point of view. It's as legitimate as is voluntary socialism of the sort of, you know, commune of people who pool their resources in some way and don't force the rest of us kicking and screaming to join their commune. It's a legitimate part of uh, capitalism, as legitimate as any other part of capitalism. We don't care about the purposes of buying private property. If your purpose is to conserve geese, well, you know, fine. Different strokes for different folks. The uh, head of the environment probe, Lewis Solomon, wrote this magnificent article in the Wall Street Journal. He said, what was it? I forget the title. Save the trees, privatize them. That was in London. London uh, newspaper, too. Well, I mean, any of us could have written that. That's a great title, and it's just a, a, a magnificent insight, and he's the head of Environment Pro. Of course, David Suzuki is on his board, and I've, I'm trying to figure out how that, how that can work, but I guess they have uh, internecine difficulties, too. My hypothesis is that the reason people blame capitalism for environmental depredations is because they think that what we now have is capitalism. And yet, as we all know, if we know anything in this room, is that what we now have is not exactly capitalism. It's not even 99% of it. It's, uh, it's a mixed economy. In some ways, it's pretty free. I mean, the paperclip industry is okay, and <laughs> rubber band industry is all right, but there are many industries that are regulated or uh, crown corporations or what have you, and they're not free at all. And there are many cases where government refuses to uphold its legitimate functions, if you're a limited government libertarian, of protecting property against uh, transgressors. And I think this is the main cause of the problem, not the fact, of course, that, uh, that there's any intrinsic contradiction between the market and um, sound environmental situation. There are two basic principles before I get into a consideration of a whole bunch of environmental difficulties that I want to put forth for our consideration. First is the absolute crucial importance of private property rights. I mean, you cannot possibly overemphasize how important private property rights are to the protection of the environment. If we don't have private property rights that are well-defined and even more important, fully protected, we will not have a uh, sound environment. And indeed, most of the problems that we have can be traced to the fact that either the government refuses to allow private property rights, or in some cases, that it's a little hard to see how we can apply the private property rights uh, um, uh, way of looking at things. 
certainly with the uh, case of owning oceans and owning air rights. It's a little hard, and, and a lot of research has to be done, and I think it only can be done by people such as in this room who have an appreciation of the importance of it. I mean, if you hate the very idea, you're not going to be able to do much sound research in this. And the second one is the tragedy of the commons. A typical example of the tragedy of the commons is we've all got our sheep grazing on the commons and, you know, some public-spirited uh, person, Gordon over here, sees that the uh, sheep are nipping too close to the grass, so he takes his sheep miles away at his own cost in order to preserve the grass commons. And he notices that everybody else grazes their sheep on the places that his sheep used to be on. And he says, hey, you know, uh, what's the benefit of acting uh, responsibly and public-spiritedly when everyone else just uh, takes advantage? So he stops. Another way to illustrate the tragedy of the commons is to imagine five children aged 10 to 12. And in one scenario, they've each got some soda pop and they're drinking it and, you know, at whatever rate it is, a normal, optimal rate for drinking soda pop. And in the next scenario, you pour all the soda pop into one big bowl, and you give them each five you give five straws out, one to each, and then you say, "Go get it, kids!" And you know, you probably watch as they bust the gut to uh, to get in as much as they possibly can, because they realize that if they slack off, someone will also grab it. Well, that's the tragedy of the commons, that it reduces the natural incentives that people have to cooperate with each other. See, we libertarians, or we private enterprises, know that there is explicit cooperation where you specifically get together and say, well, let's have a chess game, and you know, you have to sit there, I'll sit here, there are certain rules, and we'll enjoy ourselves that way. But we know that in addition to that, there's implicit cooperation, where we cooperate through prices and profit rates and, and private property. And it's in this sense that the tragedy of the commons just uh, brings into disarray, because we don't have private property, we have common ownership and the whole thing falls apart. Well, this will be more clear when we consider the specifics. And the specifics that I've got here are pollution and acid rain, species extinction, oil spills, garbage recycling, hazardous waste, greenhouse, ozone layer, zero population growth, and maybe if we have time, cigarette smoking. I think that ought to cover most of the issues that are considered environmental difficulties, and if I've missed one, maybe we'll get to it in a question and answer period, and next time I give this speech, I'll add that one to it, because I'm trying to be as uh, exhaustive as I can. <laughs> or inclusive, maybe that's a better word. <laughs> First, let's start with pollution and acid rain. Up until the 1830s and 1840s, any time there was a, a trespass, and then what we would now consider an environmental trespass or a pollution, it was taken care of under the law of nuisance. They reasoned quite, quite adequately, quite logically, that if I take my garbage and I dump it on Daniel's lawn and they catch me in the act, it's very clear what will happen. You know, the forces of law and order will grab me and say, you know, uh, that's a violation of uh, Daniel's property rights, and you just can't do that. You've got to, we're going to grant Daniel an injunction so that you don't do it again. We're going to make you pay uh, the damages, we'll, and we'll put you in jail if you uh, keep going. But if I were to burn it up first, pulverize it, burn it up, and instead of dumping eggshells and orange peels and box tops on his lawn, I first burn them and then they set the soot and the ashes onto his lawn, they would see no difference. They were quite sensible, and they'd say, well, come on, you can't fool us. You're doing the same thing as in the first place, and you're still a nuisance, and we're going to still do what we would have done to you in the other case, in the present case. But around 1830 or 1840, a more sophisticated uh, knowledge of the law came to being. <laughs> The judges still uh, said, yes, yes, this is a violation of property rights. We admit that, uh, they would say to the plaintiff. But there's something more important than your stinking, sniveling, greedy private property rights. <laughs> and what is that? Well, we get a drum roll and, you know, something uh, flashing in neon. I guess they didn't have neon in those days. But what it was was the public good. The public good has to take precedence over greed and selfishness and, and individualism, right? Right. So, 
what we're going to do is we're not going to grant you an injunction to stop the perpetrator. He can uh, uh, send smoke wafting onto your property. He can uh, ruin your laundry. He can set off sparks uh, on your haystacks. And uh, we're not going to stop him. We're going to give him, in effect, carte blanche to do as he will with your property. Not only with his property, but with your property. And there were other reasons besides the public interest. There was this idea that uh, there was the public good. And in other words, what we're going to do is we're going to give a license to the railroad to do it. And since the railroad is running it, uh, it can, and it sets off sparks, well, that's just too bad. We, we, we the legislature, have given this railroad our imprimatur, and whatever they do is legitimate. And there was a, another reason that if the smoke only went from person A to, to person B, that would have a private remedy. But if the smoke went from person A to 50 other people, it was now considered a public nuisance, and you couldn't sue as an individual because, you know, it's, you're just one of many. So the proper uh, uh, place to go is the legislature, not the court, and they have to pass a law, and needless to say, they pass no such law because they were, in effect, bribed more fully by the perpetrators of this than by the defendants or by the victims. Well, that's the old, uh, the old story. So what were the results of this? The results of allowing manufacturers to get away with polluting other people's property were that they now had no incentive not to. Suppose that you were public spirited, and you were a uh, free enterprise person, and, and you, were, you were dedicated to the philosophy of, of uh, liberty and freedom. And you said that it's wrong to violate other people's property. And what you're going to do is you're going to engage in research and development in, in smoke prevention devices. You're going to install scrubbers in your uh, smokestacks. You're going to burn high-grade coal, which doesn't have much uh, 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 pollution, although it's more expensive, instead of the low-grade sulfur coal that, you know, just blackens the sky. Well, what would happen to you if you did all these things? You'd go broke, right? Because you presumably are just as able as your competitors in, say, steel manufacturing, and everyone else is just blithely polluting the air, and you alone are engaging in extra cost so that you don't pollute the air, well, you'll go broke. That's the market. See? Free enterprise doesn't work, right? No. Free enterprise works, but only if it's embedded in a legal system that upholds private property rights. Free enterprise doesn't work if we don't have private property rights. Right? It's too much to claim for the market system that it can work adequately, that people can act responsibly, if the incentives are all perverted. And they were all perverted by the fact that the rights of the uh, victims were not upheld. So much for kissing smokestacks. Now, some people describe what I just called as an intolerable situation as one of externality. And they call this a market failure. They really do. They say this is a market failure. Because while the company takes into account all of its sales, it, it, uh, it it gets the money for its product, it doesn't take into account all its costs. And there are people who say this that are reputable, supposed advocates of the free enterprise system, such as based at the University of Chicago. If you read most economics textbooks and you look under the category called market failure, you'll see externalities as a market failure. I'm not kidding you. People uh, who you might think are real free enterprise advocates are saying things like this, that this is a market failure. But it's no such thing. It's a failure of government or law to uphold property rights. They see it as a fault of capitalism that the businessman can keep all of his revenues but is allowed to impose some of his costs, such as smoke particle removal, on other people. This is absolute nonsense. Acid rain, by the way, is just a special case of the more general pollution problem. Instead of the pollutants going from A to B and C and D, they first go up into the clouds and into the water, but it's the same thing, and then they affect everyone else. So I don't really see that there's any reason to treat acid rain as a special problem. It's just part and parcel of the pollution problem. Then there are these other, uh, the Chicago-type economists, these supposed free enterprises, who say that the solution to the problem is not to uphold property rights, but rather to have the government set up a, uh, an optimal level of pollution 
And then to sell, I'm not kidding you, you know, I'm not making this up. It sounds like I am, but, but I'm not. And what we have to do is say, well, in Toronto we can have 100 tons of pollution, and I don't know if it's 100 or 1,000 or a million, whatever they decide. And there is no rationale behind any decision. It's all arbitrary. You know, we'll pick X, and X is the right amount of pollution. And then what we'll do is we'll sell or auction off the rights to pollute. Well, I want to read a magnificent quote. I wish I had written it, and I suppose I could take credit for it, but it would be a lie. But but I really meant to write this, and, <laughs> and, and he beat me to it. He stole my ideas, actually. <laughs> He's a thief. I'll have to sue him. It's Martin Anderson, who is just utterly magnificent, and this is in my uh, introduction to this book. If you took a bag of garbage, quote, if you took a bag of garbage and dropped it on your neighbor's lawn, we all know what would happen. Your neighbor would call the police, and you would soon find out that the disposal of your garbage is your responsibility and that it must be done in a way that does not violate anyone else's property rights. But if you took that same bag of garbage and burned it in the backyard incinerator, letting the city ash drift over the neighborhood, the problem gets more complicated. The violation of property rights is clear, but protecting them is more difficult. And when the garbage is invisible to the naked eye, as much air and water pollution is, the problem often seems insurmountable. We have tried many remedies in the past. We have tried to dissuade polluters with fines, with government programs whereby all pay to clean up the garbage produced by the few, with a myriad of detailed regulations to control the degree of pollution. Now, some even seriously propose that we should have economic incentives to charge polluters a fee for polluting, and the more they pollute, the more they pay. But this is just like taxing burglars as an economic incentive to deter people from stealing your property and just as unconscionable. I mean, the man is really good. The only effective way to eliminate serious pollution is to treat it exactly for what it is, garbage. Just as one does not have the right to drop a bag of garbage on his neighbor's lawn, so does one not have the right to place any garbage in the air or in the water or in the earth if it in any way violates the property rights of others. What we need are tougher, clearer environmental laws that are enforced, not with economic incentives, but with jail terms. What the strict application of the idea of private property rights will do is to increase the cost of garbage disposal. That increased cost will be reflected in a higher cost for the products and services that resulted from the process that produced the garbage. And that is how it should be. Much of the cost of disposing of waste material is already incorporated in the price of the goods and services produced. All of it should be. Then only those who benefit from the garbage will be made to pay for its disposal. See, the problem is of the present remedy that came about in the 1830s and 1840s is that we subsidized our entire industry to engage in pollution-intensive methods of production. But they didn't have to engage in those. They only did because that was the way the economic incentives were set up. Had law and order prevailed from the very beginning, the uh, industry would have been led, as if by an invisible hand, says Adam Smith, toward those production techniques that do not specialize in, in heavy fallout and, and pollutants. So, for 150 years, or maybe for 130 years, we went merrily on polluting ourselves. And then all of a sudden, certain people said, hey, you know, look, you know, uh, things are getting pretty desperate. One of the uh, cartoons uh, that I saw illustrates this very much. It was a, a mother and a daughter, and they're eating in an outside uh, restaurant. Now, usually, you'd expect the mother to say to the little girl, hurry up, dear, eat your soup before it gets cold. The caption here is, hurry up, little girl, eat your soup before it gets dirty. <laughs> okay, so we know that the problem is very bad. So what does the government do? It says, well, you know, it's very bad, we've got to, uh, you know, regulate, we've got to say, you know, you, you, and you, you can't use this, you have to use that, you have to uh, use uh, all sorts of techniques. One of the problems, originally, uh, incidentally, by the way, about uh, smokestacks is they used to have pretty low smokestacks, and, you know, it would be clear where the smoke is going. So guess what these geniuses came up with? Big smokestacks, you know, 150 feet high, so that, you know, the problem doesn't exist anymore, right? You, yeah. Who can see it? It's like pushing it under the rug. Well, I think that the best way is to get back to a regime of private property rights. Now, you might conceivably have to make some compromises. 
Maybe. I, it's, this is where we need some research. You know, just how do you go back 150 years? How do you turn back the clock 150 years toward a more just regime? Do you just say that no one can pollute anymore and pretty much the whole society gets wiped out? Do you grandfather it in? These are difficult problems. Or do you compromise with this crazy uh, selling of pollution rights temporarily? My own predilection, of course, would be for a rigid, uh, systematic, principled position of saying no more property uh, uh, invasion. Now, you see, in a uh, full, free society, you wouldn't have a situation where you had no pollution. Economists are always enamored of the idea of optimizing things. Even in a free society, we wouldn't aim for zero crime, because zero crime might take the entire GNP to solve. We want only optimal crime, which means that we devote only a certain amount to uh, stopping criminals. Well, it's the same here. We want optimal amounts of pollution. Now, in the free society, the way the optimal amount of pollution would be determined is through voluntary contracts. Namely, in the 1830s, I set up a steel mill in, in Cleveland somewhere, and I buy, uh, you know, 10 square miles of property, and I keep a low uh, smokestack, and we decide that uh, pretty much all of the pollution stays there. And then I sell you a house on the grounds that I've got the pollution rights to that air. And if you want to buy that house, you buy it at a lower price that reflects the disamenity. You see, and in that case, the pollution is internalized. I'm not violating anyone's rights, even though I'm polluting them, because they've agreed to be polluted. You get it? It's the same with airport noise and noise pollution. If I have an airport, uh, one square mile, and then I buy uh, 10 square miles, and I plunk the airport right in the middle, and then I start selling houses in this area, which is... Uh, noise polluted, and I sell it to you under the full knowledge that your house is going to be noisy, well, you have no right to complain about the noise. It is no longer an invasion. In technical economic parlance, the externality has been internalized. There is no more uh, transgression. Okay, that's enough for pollution. The next one I want to talk about is species extinction. Are you all still with me? Or are you... Uh I don't want anyone falling asleep on me or <laughs> getting horizontal neurosis. Um, maybe I should get up here and do a tap dance. Too. Okay. <laughs> okay. Species extinction. Let's begin our analysis of species extinction with the buffalo and the cow. Why is it that the buffalo was on the verge of distinct extinction? not distinction, extinction, <laughs> and the cow never was. I mean, if you look at it biologically, you can't find an answer, because these two animals are indistinguishable. I mean, they both, they're both big and fat, they both smell, they both have horns, they both have a tail, they both moo, they both give milk. If you crash into one, you're in trouble. You know? So if you just look at these two animals, you know, standing side by side, you'd find no inkling of why one almost was on the verge of extinction and the other uh, never was. I mean, the idea that the cow is extinct is you know, ludicrous. Well, the reason for it, the explanation of it, is the tragedy of the commons. The cow is always owned privately. The buffalo is always unowned. You had all this, uh, these communist songs like A Home, Home on the Range and, and Don't Fence Me In. When I was a kid, I used to watch these, uh, you know, Western movies, and you could always tell the good guys because they had the white hat and the white horse, and they wore two guns, and the bad guys had black horses, black hats, and a mustache, and only one gun. So, you know, things were simple, only it was the wrong way around because the bad guys were always trying to fence in the range. But those were the good guys, it turns out, because they were engaged in trying to privatize the common. But when we had the open range and the buffalo ran around like nuts with no control and, you know, just the irresponsible buffalo running around, how could you establish ownership of it? How could you get one? The only way is to kill it. You couldn't fence it in. So people would kill the buffalo even if all they wanted from the buffalo was the tongue, which was a delicacy. And as a result, you'd see, you know, you'd go out in the range, you know, you take your helicopter and you look down in the 1850s or something, and you see just buffalo, thousands of buffalo just sort of lying there, dead, similarly to the way the elephants are now in Africa. Whereas the cow, 
I mean, who goes into their lower 40 pantry with a machine gun and, you know, rat that cat and, you know, killing all their cows? No, it's ludicrous. Because if you own the cow and, and you don't want to use the cow today, uh, it'll be there tomorrow. But the only way to get the buffalo is to kill it. So obviously, what we have to do is to privatize the range. And once we privatize the range, then there's no problem. And now buffalo aren't extinct. They're a buffalo farm. Anyone shoots those buffalo, they call the cop, and they stop you from doing it. There are no economic incentives to act in a, uh, you know, in a nonsensical way. Now, it's the same with um, hippopotamuses and elephants. Ignorant people, like the editors of Time, Newsweek, uh, <laughs> The Economist, you know, economic illiterates say that the reason for the extinction of these animals is because of their tusks or their horns. You know, the ivory is worth 100 a pound, and the elephant tusk, I think uh, 16 pounds of it, it's $400 an ounce, it's worth about $120,000. So they say that the reason people are shooting these things is because of these valuable commodities. It's sort of like the horn and the, and the ivory is a uh, curse. And this is true under a regime of non-ownership, where the only way you can get them is to shoot them. So what the gangs of poachers do is they go out and they shoot these elephants and they take a hacksaw and they cut off the tusks or the uh, horn, and then they race off, leaving very valuable meat and very valuable hide just wasted because they, they can't get away that easily with the whole elephant. I mean, it's sort of hard to... <laughs> but, but with the tusk, you can get away, or with the horn, you can get away. And then there are these uh, people that say, well, we have to have a ban on trade in ivory. And I was on TV on the CBC Journal debating a uh, supposed conservative MLA uh, who was saying, yes, we have to have this ban. And there was this Daniel Arap Moy from Kenya or somewhere in Mozambique who burned $3.6 million worth of ivory in order to publicize the danger of the ivory, uh, or danger to the elephants. And I was saying, well, you know, it's just a waste of $3.6 million, although it was good publicity, but still, uh, the point is to privatize them. And I made statements like, you know, elephants are just cows with big ears, and, you know, and I was seen as, you know, uh, biologically illiterate or something, but <laughs> I wasn't making a biological point, I was making an economic point, that if they were just privatized, uh, there would be no problem. You see, the reason the poachers are doing so well is because the villages are the poachers. The villages hide them, protect them, because the, uh, the way they consider them is just rats with big ears. Because, you know, here they've got some crops, and all of a sudden the elephant comes slumping along, and, uh, you know, that's the end of your crop. Now, if they own the, the elephants and they own the crops and they could keep one from the other with big fences, then they would see the elephant as a resource and they would protect the elephant. But now, they're not allowed to keep that ivory legally or the meat or the, uh, the elephant skin. It's the same as with um, crocodiles. I always get crocodiles and alligators confused. They, they seem very similar to me. But crocodiles, too, were on the verge of distinction. And nowadays, we have in Florida and Louisiana crocodile farms. The leather there is worth about uh, $20 for a four-foot-long four farm-fed alligator. And the, uh, no, the leather is worth $39 a linear foot, and the meat is worth $20. Now, I'm not into this, but, you know, some people like alligator meat. And what they eat is nutria, which is ground up swamp rat, and croaker, which is a cheap fish, and then vitamin fortified dry food. And they have alligator farms. And uh, while the alligator or the crocodile, I forget which it is, was on the verge of extinction, now there are 75,000 alligators in 89. This is triple what there was in, in 87. I guess the buggers breed pretty well. <laughs> Uh, when, when under the tender mercy care of, of farmers who have an economic incentive to make sure that they breed and that they're not slaughtered. Okay. Unfortunately, the uh, people, many of the consumers, still think that the alligator or the crocodile or whatever it is is ex on the verge of extinction, so they're not buying handbags as quickly as they might. But you see, the alligator skin Let's not talk about the meat, it's sort of yucky, but at least the alligator skins, the handbags, and shoes was, was a curse for this animal when it was unowned. And now that it's owned, 
It's not a curse. It's the reason that farmers preserve them. I mean, the reason we preserve cows is because they have economic value. If you took the economic value away, then they'd be in trouble. Which leads me to the next breed of animal. See, there, there, I guess I would divide animals into three kinds. There are first the animals that have some value for us. Well, if they're privatized, we have no problem. Second are the animals that we really don't like too much, like Anopheles, mosquitoes, and you know, causes of death and stuff. It'd be very hard to see how free enterprise could keep them alive. But even in, those, in the case of those species, we would, because they might conceivably have some value for us in the future. Now, who would be so forward-looking as to keep alive uh, pneumonic plague, rats, and stuff like that? Well, there are two groups that I can think of. One is pharmaceutical companies, who might, in 50 years or 100 years, find some use for them. And the other is university, private university, uh, biology departments and chemistry departments, who would also have an economic advantage in having these breeds not be extinct so that their students could learn from them. Remember that um, Star Trek movie where the, um, the whales, uh, there were no whales in, in our century? Star Trek IV, there's a Trekkie there. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, there were these super powerful beings, the Martians or whoever, they were friends of, um, of whales, and they discovered that there were no whales, so they were going to just uh, you know, kill the Earth, the entire Earth. And our Trekkies had to go to a different century, namely back to the present, to get him and bring him back to the future. You had to be there to, <laughs> to appreciate this. Well, this leads to the question of whales and seals and other sea life uh, mammals that are now on the verge of extinction. How would the market handle them? Well, the answer to me seems to be to privatize the ocean. You know, if it moves, privatize it. If it doesn't move, privatize it. Privatize everything. That's our motto here. And, you know, when I uh, address this to most audiences, they're sort of, their draw, they're, not their drawers, their jaws drop. <laughs> well, maybe their drawers drop too, I don't know. <laughs> they say, well, you know, that's imbecilic. How can you privatize the oceans? You know, it's watery, it moves, you know, you can't privatize it. Well, I don't know. I mean, a, a species that can get up to the moon, that can cure polio, that can do all these other great things, can surely make sure that a bunch of fish stay put where we tell them to. <laughs> and, you know, don't, you know, swim around where they're not supposed to. We probably have the technology even now. And if we don't, surely in 50 or 100 years, we'd have the uh, electronic devices to, you know, make invisible electronic walls in the ocean so that the, uh, the whales stay where we tell them to. You know, we engage in farming of whales and porpoises or whoever else is out there in, in the briny deep. Uh, I don't see the... Now, maybe you'd need big uh, areas for them to roam around. You don't have to have a private property holding of one acre of ocean. You know, you could have maybe a thousand square mile plots. You know, Farmer Jones owns this, Farmer Smith owns that, what have you. Um, I don't see any in principle reason why we couldn't privatize these things. And I see great reasons for us to do this. I uh, happen to be a uh, human being foe. I like human beings. I want to. I wish them well. I, I'm prejudiced. I happen to be one. <laughs> and uh, my hope is that eventually, and I'm, I'm sort of uh, anticipating some of the zero population growth stuff. My hope is that eventually, instead of uh, six billion people, uh, we'll have uh, 60 trillion people on this earth. And I think we've got plenty of room for them. But if we're going to do it, we're going to have to expand from the one quarter of the Earth's surface that is now land into the three quarters that is ocean. The, the point that I would put forth for our consideration is that when we were hunters and gatherers on the Earth, we could only support a couple of hundred thousand people. When we became farmers on the Earth, we could support a few million people or a few billion. But right now, with regard to the oceans, we are as if we were on the land 100,000 years ago. Namely, we're just hunters and gatherers. We're not farming the ocean. We're not using it rationally. And until we can do for the oceans what we now do for the land, namely farm it and rationalize it, our prospects are very limited. The third group of animals with regard to extinction is um, groups like uh, snail daughters and other animals that are neither very good nor very bad, but sort of we're indifferent to them. And again, the, the same principles would apply. 
There are people that would have economic incentives to keep them alive. As well, even if there are species that are disappearing, there are also species that are continually coming into existence. And we have to make a distinction. You know, the answer to this or that is not both, always, because both has costs. Somebody has got to make a decision, a private decision, whether, you know, the, the monkey or the worm or whatever it is is worth preserving if it's extinct and it has no, op, no obvious value to people right now. Okay, that's it for extinct species. We move right now on to oil spills. The Exxon Valdez dropped 10 million gallons into the Alaska Harbor. This is a big deal in BC because we were closer, but I imagine that um, the greenos around here, the pinko greenos, were very unhappy about that. It's the third biggest oil spill in the history of the world. The second biggest was the Amoco Cadiz in, uh, off the coast of France, which dropped 68 million gallons, and the biggest one was a um, offshore oil drilling rig off the coast of Yucatan in 1979, which spewed forth 155 million gallons. And it's really pretty yucky. I mean, the oil has the consistency of sort of black mayonnaise, and it just gets on everything. And I'm not one of these right-wingers that say, well, you know, what's a little oil between friends? Or <laughs> uh, They come up with these analogies that say, well, if you take the 10 million gallons and divide it in the, numer in the denominator by all the water on the earth, it's as if you drop one little drop of oil into a big swimming pool. Namely, it's nothing. Well, you know, I wouldn't want to swim around there, but, uh, but the point is, see, I think our proper answer is to not demean this and say, well, it's just the concern of the greenies and the hell with them, you know, they're not us, so whatever they say is wrong. I think the appropriate stance is to say that, yes, this is a tragedy. All these birds are dying and uh, needlessly, and all of these uh, shores are being polluted. They won't be able to fish or swim or use any recreation uh, for quite a number of years, and it's just a violation of property rights. So I don't think we have to welcome this and be indifferent to it and say it, it's, it's a great thing or anything. Now, let's get into the causes of this. The causes, as you can imagine, were not capitalism, were not free enterprise, were not markets. The causes were government intervention, prior government intervention. No, not a drunken skipper. It's not the fault of the drunken skipper. Some people say it was Exxon's fault because they didn't fire the drunken skipper. The point is that drunkenness has been made a handicap in the U.S. They were not allowed to fire him. They had no incentive to keep a drunken skipper, or what airline has an economic incentive to keep a drunken pilot? It's because of these laws that require, you know, minorities have rights. Drunks have rights. They have a right to be behind the cockpit. Well, now that's lunacy. And that's the, the proximate cause. But there, there's more to the story than just that, that proximate cause. Other problems are that the, the law, the admiralty law, as I understand it right now, limits the... So even if we didn't have a drunken skipper, accidents occur. I mean, we're human beings. There's got to be accidents. Human beings are the mistake-making animal. There's got to be oil spill. This one was drunkenness, but uh, that's just extra. But the rule of the admiralty law is that the limit of the limitation of liability of the company is the value of the boat and the oil and the cargo. Now, what kind of nonsense is that? Surely, the, the responsibility of the person that does that is not limited to the value of the sinking boat and, and the cargo, but rather to the damage he does. I mean, that would be a much more rational uh, way of dealing with it. Uh, fishermen have no right to sue because we don't recognize, we, that is, our government, shouldn't make that equation, our government, our blessed, you know, all-powerful, all-benevolent government, does not recognize fishermen's right to anything in the ocean because they don't own it, so they can't sue. So that's another problem with it. But I think the ultimate cause of the problem is that the oceans are owned in common. They're owned by no one. There's this UN Law of the Sea Treaty that's being booted about, and I think Canada signed, but happily uh, the U.S. didn't, and the U.S. counts for more than Canada on this one and on many other things. And they're saying that everybody, you know, some guy in, in a jungle should have the one over in of the rights to the ocean as everyone else, even though they don't do anything to earn it. 
and this is being applied to the moon or to Mars or what have you, that it's the common heritage of all mankind. We all own it in common, not those who homestead it or, or who do something with it. The answer again is to own bits of the ocean. I know if I owned a bit of the ocean and I got rents from fishermen and stuff, I would want to keep the world clear. I might insist on double hoeing. Now there was a political process where they tried to get double hoeing, but the political process failed for the u usual reason of the concentration, the different concentration ratios. Namely, the oil company was in a much better position to bribe the, uh, the commissioners than were the possible victims who were too disparate and spread out. See, it might cost us a lot altogether, billions, but it cost each of us a nickel, and why should we get excited for a nickel? Whereas the, uh, the oil companies, it only will save them millions, but it, they've got a great incentive to make sure things go their way. Well, I know if I own a bit of the ocean, I would insist that uh, you double hull, or if you don't double hull, you, your rates of transport are quadruple, or something. See, once we privatize this stuff, we would have less problems. Still, we'd have oil spills. We're not trying to get no oil spills. We're trying to get optimal number of them, and the optimal number of them, I'm convinced, is far fewer than we now have. Okay, I'm going to... Uh, I'm supposed to speak for an hour, and I've been speaking for 50 minutes, and I've got three or four <coughs> topics more, so I'm not going to be able to cover everything with the thoroughness that I'd like to, but I'd like to at least touch upon a few of these other topics. So let me run through uh, a few of them, and maybe I won't reach them all, and we can discuss some of them in the after period, question and answer period. The next one is um, recycling. Now, this is another, another fetish. You know, everybody is saying, uh, you know, you've got a styrofoam cup, you're evil, you know, you're, a, I don't know, you're an environmental pervert or something, and uh, you're using a plastic bag, and, and you're no good, you're not ecologically friendly or something, and, and you know, people are uh, having campaigns about this, and again, guess whose fault it is? It's the capitalist, the greedy capitalist, who makes these plastic bags and these styrofoam cups without any consideration of what will happen to them afterwards. And not only is it the greedy capitalist, but there's an unholy alliance of the greedy capitalist and the uncaring consumer who buys these things, who goes to the shopping mall and, you know, just puts the stuff in a plastic bag and, you know, doesn't think about it. This is the way the greenos see the problem. And I agree with them. Th this is a problem. And people are acting irresponsibly. I mean, granted that it, when you try to recycle this stuff or you try to put it in the earth, it ruins the earth, I think we do have over-optimal amount of money in styrofoam and in plastics. But my explanation for this problem is not because of greedy capitalism and uncaring uh, consumers, it's rather, you know, I hate to sound like a parrot, you know, every time there's a problem, it's, it's the government, but if anyone can think of any other culprit, I'll be glad to, you know, just for, you know, comic relief or something, stick them in there, but it's the government. And the reason for it in my analysis is because we have markets, the supermarket is a market. We have markets, you have to pay for the stuff. So when you go in and you buy a plastic bag, it costs you a penny. For, for one plastic bag. Now, it's true you don't explicitly pay that penny, but you pay for it in the cost of your groceries, or whether it's a paper bag. Um, but we don't have a market in the disposal of it. Rather, who disposes of it? It begins with a G. <laughs> <laughs> government. Government disposes of it. What government does is it says, in effect, to us, Yes, worry about the cost of producing it because you're going to have to pay for it, but forget about the cost of disposing it. We'll do it. Not for free with your tax money, but we'll do it. So that you don't have to be concerned about disposing of it. Now suppose that the economic situation was, were as follows. It costs a penny to make a paper bag. It costs a penny to make a plastic bag. It costs a penny to dispose of a paper bag. And it costs five bucks to dispose of a plastic bag. I'm just picking five bucks out of the air, but it costs more than a penny, okay? Well, now the choice to the consumer is very different. The consumer says to himself, well, if I take this paper bag, it'll cost me a penny to produce it, a penny to dispose of it for a grand total of two cents. If I take the plastic bag, it'll cost me a penny to buy it, 
and five bucks to dispose of it for a grand total of 501. Now, do I really value this plastic bag at uh, 250 times as much as the paper bag? You know, am I really that hopped up about having plastic? And the answer is no. They would spurn the plastic bag, they would take the paper bag, and the recycling problem would be solved. Because the only people that would be using plastic bags would be people for whom it really is worth 250 times as much as the paper. Namely, hospitals or certain uh, technical processes of production. I don't know who. I'm, I'm an economist. I'm not a uh, manufacturer. But I presume that there are certain people for whom the plastic is very important, and they would use it, and they'd be very far fewer than they are now. So this whole problem is a, a, a sum total of the fact that the government not only monopolizes garbage collection, but dumping. Landfills and garbage collection should be privatized. Not only for the reason of it'll save us bundles of money because they'll do it more efficiently, that goes, you know, just without saying, but also because it'll solve the ecological crisis. So this, eco you know, when people say, well, McDonald's is evil, and, you know, I had this picture of McDonald's, you know, with the styrofoam here and styrofoam there, and people won't eat there, and they say that the market is irresponsible. It's because there is no market. It's because of the, the mixed part of the mixed economy. It's not because of the laissez-faire part. Okay, enough for recycling. Now we move on to hazardous waste. The most famous case of hazardous waste was the Love Canal situation. And again, this was really yucky. You know, people were noticing that their walls were green and, you know, sort of gooey, and then their arms were falling off at the elbow. And, you know, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but it was a real... I mean, if you were living in Love Canal uh, and you thought it was due to capitalism, it would turn you on to socialism forever. But the reality of the situation is that the Hooker Chemical Company at one... Oh, well, <laughs> it's just a, uh, just a coincidence, I'm sure. It you know. <laughs> reminds me of this joke that uh, there were three people, uh, you know, shooting up on the corner, heroin, and they were sharing needles, and somebody came by and said, well, don't you realize you can catch AIDS if you share needles? I said, no, 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 don't worry about it. We're all using condoms. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had to get in my quick, dirty joke in there. Now, the, the Hooker uh, Chemical Company uh, it was involved in certain toxic waste, I forget what, and what it did is it buried it in, conc uh, in very carefully in concrete and, and barrels and, you know, 10-foot thick concrete, and that was it. And then the Hooker Company got expropriated. That property got expropriated by, guess who, it begins with a G. <laughs> the government expropriated the Hooker Chemical Companies. Uh, by the way, th this article was in Reason, a magnificent article in Reason, where they discussed that. And uh, if you... Oh, okay. Well, it makes the rounds. And what happened is they expropriated this and gave it over to a public school. And Hooker said, well, you know, in their bill of sale, be careful, whatever you do, don't uh, mess around. It's sort of like, you know, these uh, horror movies where... Somebody sells you something on the condition that you don't open the third drawer, ever. <laughs> and, you know, you're opening the first drawer and the second and the fourth, and, you know, one day you say, well, I wonder where, and then, you know, something springs out. Well, they told him, don't do it. So, to make a long story short, guess what they did? They did it. A public school was put in there, and they, you know, they went, they drilled, they opened the chemicals, and the chemicals got into the Love Canal and started seeping around. And this, again, is a failure of capitalism. Well, I mean, the obvious answer is that uh, we shouldn't be expropriating property, and if we're going to expropriate property, and they tell us not to open the third drawer, then don't open the third drawer. <laughs> so, um, I don't think too much of the hazardous waste case against the market. What about the greenhouse effect case against the market? Well. What is the greenhouse effect? The greenhouse effect, very briefly, from a non-scientific layman point of view, is that there are certain chemicals, carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide, carbon something hide, gets into the air, and what it does is it keeps the, uh, the sun in, it keeps the heat in, but it um, doesn't allow the cold to get in or something. I don't know. <laughs> Boy, am I being incoherent. It's the same phenomena as in a very cold day, a cold but sunny day, and you're in a car. 
and you feel a lot warmer because the sun gets in and the heat doesn't get out. That's it. The carbon keeps the heat from getting out, but uh, so it makes it warmer. The only problem with this, oh, and the problem is that if the Earth gets warmer, it'll melt the polar ice caps and we'll be up to our ears in water. And you know, if you're not good at treading water, you'll be in trouble. <laughs> uh, the only problem with this is that there's no evidence for it, or at least the scientific community, the majority of opinion does not support the fact that we have a greenhouse effect. Uh, they look back on temperatures for the last hundred years and they, they see some ups and some downs and some ups and some downs and they see no pattern that is consistent with more carbon being in the air and more, uh, more heat. Some things get hotter, some things get colder, but this has been occurring for many years. So there really is no greenhouse effect. Now some other people say, you know, the chicken little who says the sky is falling, by the way, a lot of the people who say there is the greenhouse effect, these are the same people that say we we're going to run out of oil and we we're going to run out of wood and you know all these other ecological disasters that never came through, and now they're doing it again. So they, they lack a little credibility. As against that, they only have to be right once. You know, so we have to you know, be careful, at least, so we have to be cautious. As against that, we have a basis in Western law that you're innocent until proven guilty. And if there's no evidence that you're doing anything wrong, you can hardly force people to do something on the grounds that they're trespassing if there's no evidence that they're trespassing. Then this is complicated, the greenhouse effect is complicated by the whole forestry situation. And the forestry situation is a lot clearer than the, the greenhouse effect situation. It is maintained by scientists, and I'm not competent to know whether this is true or not, that the greenery, the trees, serve as the lungs of the earth. They take in the carbon dioxide and they come out with oxygen. Well, we'll stipulate that that's true. You know that joke about the, uh, there was the economist, the uh, chemist, the physicist, and the engineer, and they were stuck on this desert island, and they had a whole bunch of canned goods and no can opener. So the physicist and the chemist and the engineer, they're huddling and saying, well, you know, blah, 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 uh, equations and, you know, pulleys and, you know, should we throw the can against the rock and all sorts of things. And then they turn to the economist and they say, well, how can you contribute to our deliberations? And the economist says, well, assume we have a can opener. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's assume that we have a greenhouse effect. One of the saving graces of the forest is that they will help solve the greenhouse effect. The only problem is that the forests are disappearing. And there's a little story as to why the forests are disappearing, and I'll give you one guess as to whose fault that is. <laughs> That's the government's fault. The reason, again, is the tragedy of the commons. See, what happens is that these forests are not privately owned. The U.S. is a little better than Canada in the sense that only the government only owns about 60% of the land in the U.S. In Canada, the government owns about 90% or 89%. Then if you forget about the Northwest Territory and the Yukon, it's about 85%. We, I've got these statistics in the book. And the problem is that what they do is they don't allow the private companies to own the, the forest, where they would treat it as if they owned it and they would protect it, and if they clear-cut, they would replant, because if they didn't replant after clear-cutting, the value of the land would dissipate. But rather what they do is they say, look, we'll give you... We'll give you a lease. Six months. Do what you will with this land for six months. And that's your time horizon. So what they do is they level it, and they don't replant, and the government tries to get them to replant, and they, they're unsuccessful. And uh, when the governments run out of money, the first thing that they stop is replanting, because, you know, welfare rights are more important than replanting. So we've got a lot of dissipation of the farms. In addition, what the government does in the few cases of private ownership in the U.S. is they build logging roads, thus making accessible to cutting trees that would never be accessible to cutting without their subsidization of the cutting through these logging roads. And in Brazil, what they do is they subsidize private farmers to go in and cut down the trees and start cattle farms, because they've got this perverted idea that they can't import beef from Argentina, God forbid, because of, you know the Brazilian cultural nationalism will be ruined by from some other country. Does that sound familiar? 
So these are the reasons that the forests are now being dissipated. And then the governments in the northern hemisphere are, are saying that the Brazilians are stupid and evil for not uh, uh, preserving their forests. But this is hypocritical. If they're so worried about the forest, let them you know, preserve their own. Let them privatize. And we get back to this environmental probe article, save the trees, sell them. And I think that, that really uh, is a very important case in point. Now, I think I only have two more points. I'm running a little past my time, but I've got the ozone layer, zero population growth, and cigarette smoking, but I'm out of time. So shall I just give another few minutes and then? OK. OK. The natives aren't restless yet. Just the cigarette smokers. We'll get to that. <laughs> we'll get to them in a minute. We'll deal with those people. Now, the ozone layer, it is alleged that chlorofluorocarbons, I want a little applause for being able to pronounce that. <laughs> I've been working on it. My pronunciation is getting better of these. I had a hard time in chemistry in college, and now I'm <laughs> back in it. Right. Instead <laughs> of distraction or something. Uh, it is alleged that the CFCs in aerosol and foam products and air conditioners refrigerators act in such a way as to combine with oxygen as to either increase or decrease ozone. I'm not sure what it is. I think decrease, decrease the ozone. So we have openings in the air where we're not protected by the ozone and we'll get more skin cancer. Well, one problem with this is that the ozone hole is over Antarctic, and they don't have too many refrigerators up there. Just the ones that we've been selling, you know, the Eskimos, those, <laughs> all those refrigerators that we sold the Eskimos. They're the only ones up there, and there are none of them, so it's strange why the ozone hole would be there. Also, the scientific community is, again, not of the overwhelming opinion that there is any ozone hole problem. Another interesting point is that the people behind this ozone stuff are mainly DuPont. DuPont is in favor of prohibiting freons and CFCs and things like that. And it's also an interesting point, which I'm sure is completely coincidental and has nothing to do with this, that DuPont holds patents for the substitutes for freons. Now, I want the jury to just, you know, to, <laughs> to just uh, not consider this as at all relevant, but. Uh, uh, it might be of interest to someone to know just you know these, these backgrounds here. But let's suppose that there really is a problem. Let's suppose you know you know the economists will assume it can't open. Let's assume a problem. Let's assume that Dupont is innocent, and let's you know because it could be. It's not a logical contradiction to suppose that there is a problem. Well, then we get back to the uh, to the old stamping grounds of pollution. If it really is true that to use an aerosol can or an air conditioner or refrigerated with present, um, under present technology is to dissipate the ozone layer and to increase skin cancer, it seems to me that this is a prima facie case of uh, violation of property rights. Now, it's true it's hard to see, you know, who's going to own the air, and, you know, we really need a lot of thinking about that, but we don't have to own the air. We just have to own the rights not to be aggressed against. And I think it's not too much of an extension of violation, rights violations to assume that if it really did work this way, it would be a rights violation. Maybe I'm being impure in this. Maybe a rights violation is only with a gun, but I don't think so. I think that it, if the allegation were true, we have no embarrassment about it philosophically. We just say, yes, this is a violation of property rights, and we stop it, period. So again, I don't think that it, it there's anything in the environmental challenge that makes us reconsider our philosophy of freedom. Not only is our philosophy of freedom right and just, it is also pragmatic. Last but not, oh no, not last, next to last but not least is zero population growth. People are saying, well, you know, there are too many people around here. Uh, in China, they forbid people from having more than one child, and, and it's really disgraceful what happens because people are biased toward having male children, and they find out they have a female child, and they abort. You wonder what's going to happen in 20 years in China when there are all these boys running around and no girls. It'll you know, be a social prostitution, but it, I mean, it'll be a social disarray. Uh, there are some statistics that might convince you that we have no overpopulation problem. 
One of them is that if we took everybody on the earth, all six billion people of us, and put them into Ontario in the form of four people to a family, pardon me for using such a, a word. <laughs> uh, four, <laughs> I don't mean to curse or you know to be obnoxious, but oh, okay, well, local mores, you have to. <laughs> uh, if we put everybody on the earth, all six billion of us, into the uh, province of Ontario in the form of four people to a house where the house is the usual middle class sized house with a front yard and a backyard and two stories, I think it's 8,200 square feet, everybody on earth would fit into Ontario. That's one instance to convince you how empty this planet is. Another one is if you just took all the people, and I think you count them as three cubic feet, if you stuck them all into a cube, the cube would be one mile. Namely, a mile up, a mile wide, a mile deep, you can get everybody in it. It'd be a little crowded, there'd be, you know, uh, there'd be some, uh, you know, I'm not advocating that we do this, but, you know, it would make the New York subway system look, uh, you know, like empty, but, you know, we, we'd all be living cheek by jowl here, but it'd just be for a few seconds. It'd be sort of like, you know, the way uh, college kids get into a phone booth? Well, that would be something like that. Well, I mean, if it's just one square mile and this earth is a lot bigger, I forget how big it is, you know, there, there are very few people. Um, it's, it's also not true that poverty is correlated at all with overpopulation. You know, we speak of the teeming masses of India and all the Indians are poor, but what about the teeming masses of Toronto or the teeming masses of uh, Paris or London? or Manhattan. I mean, they're teeming, or San Francisco, well, forget about San Francisco for a moment. <laughs> Los Angeles, they're teeming in there, but they're pretty rich. And then there are people that are dying like flies in the desert, like Ethiopia, where there are hardly any people per square mile. If you make a table where you put uh, rich or poor and, and population density, you can fill in all the boxes. That is, you get some poor uh, concentrated countries, some poor, empty countries, some rich, concentrated countries, some rich, empty countries. Poverty has got nothing to do with it, uh, with overpopulation. What it's got to do with is the big G. <laughs> Too much G. That'll get you every time. I once debated somebody on this, and I used the following argument, and I got roundly booed and hissed, but I'm sure in this audience I won't. What I said is that my opponent has it within his power to reduce the population by one. <laughs> the fact that he's sitting over there waiting to get on this podium shows that he doesn't believe in his own theory. He's a hypocrite. And then I sat down. <laughs> and they booed me mercilessly. But, well, <laughs> and he got up and sort of, uh, you know, a little sickly grin because it's true. I mean, if he's so concerned about extra people, you know, let him take the one action that, that the libertarian philosophy allows him to deal with this problem. And, you know, uh, let's have one less person. But I don't, you know, even him, I don't think he should kill himself because I think people are precious and people are very valuable. And I take a very long-run perspective on this problem. Very, very long-run. My long-run perspective is that one day, not soon, but in a couple of billion years, the sun will go out. And on that time, we'd better have technology and enough spaceships or beaming up Scotty machines or whatever it is to get to the next universe. You would know about this as a Trekkie, that, you know, the importance of beaming machines or whatever it is. But beaming machines and technology of the sort that, we, that only science fiction writers can now imagine is something that will come about by a couple of geniuses. Lots of geniuses. Einstein. And I know that the more billions of people we have, the more likely we will be to get a few Einsteins. So I'd like to see this world, instead of six billion people, you know, 60 trillion people, and I think we could all fit very happily if we didn't have any zoning laws that you, know, you can't build more than 10-story buildings. I mean, you know, with technology like that in a couple of dozen years, or even now we can build 150-story buildings, you know, if we build 3,000-story buildings and own the oceans. We can get a lot more people in here without any uh, crowding or anything. And uh, I'm not saying tomorrow, but, you know, ultimately. So I don't see any overpopulation problem. I see each person is indescribably precious. 
and important. And, and this overpopulation is just another incidence of this uh, death wish that I started the, the talk with. I mean, there are certain people that just, they don't want to have the decency to commit suicide on their own. They want to take the rest of us with them. And this permeates their philosophy, and the overpopulationism is just one more instance of it. Let me get to cigarette smoking, and then I'll pause for breath. Pardon the pun. <laughs> Didn't mean it. Now, we have to divide cigarette smoking, the effects of cigarette smoking, into two. On the one hand, there are the intrapersonal effects, and on the other hand, there are the interpersonal effects. Now, our friends on the left, or our friends uh, on the G side, want to deny this distinction. They want to say that everything is interpersonal. There is no such thing as smoking that involves only you, because we have socialized medicine. And if, who's the smoker here? You're, you're the smokers here. If you smoke, you get lung cancer, and then I have to pay for you, so I'll prohibit you from doing it in the first place. So there are no intrapersonal effects. They might think it to be so, but it's not so. It really affects the rest of us, and we have a right to tell them to stop. Well, according to that logic, we can make them not eat chocolate, make them brush their teeth, make them drink their milk, you know, no hang gliding, no, no, no basketball, you know, you hurt your knee when you go up for a rebound. I mean, there are so many things that we could prohibit people from doing on the grounds that if they do them, they'll hurt themselves and we'll have to pay for them through socialized medicine. Well, I've got a great solution. I'm sure it didn't occur to any of you. <laughs> Why not get rid of socialized medicine and keep our freedom? I mean, it seems a lot more logical to me. Okay, now let's take the, the case of secondary smoke, where obviously it does affect other people. You know, you smoke and other people breathe in the, uh, the fumes or what have you. So what does the government do? It, it very inflexibly either prohibits it or sets up smoking sections in restaurants. And all of this is not as good as the marketplace could, have, could do. What the marketplace could do is be much more um, flexible. Because remember, what the market is trying to do is please customers. The customer is always right. <coughs> and maybe what you'd have in, in some restaurants, say the, the beer and pizza parlors and the bowling alleys, they'd allow smoking, or at least some of them would. They'd have all smoking anywhere you want, and others would have smoking sections, and others would have smoke-free, and they'd compete. Not only on the quality of their beer, pizza, and bowling alleys, but also on the ability to tailor smoking rules to satisfy the most people. And then sure, they could do it better than a government edict which says, you know, one rule for everybody. And maybe in health food stores, uh, they would just have no smoking. Or maybe it would be at different hours or different times. It's hard to know. We can't predict the market. All we can say is that if people are allowed to compete, they're more likely to come up with solutions to the problem than a bureaucrat sitting in Ottawa or Toronto or wherever it is deciding the rest of our lives. So, to summarize my position, it might seem that from the, the concentration on the environmental issue that we have met a problem for our philosophy. I conclude that we have not met any problem that the entire difficulty of the environment and ecology and extinction of species and pollution and all the rest is not an unraveling of the market, does not show an inconsistency of free enterprise or liberty, but rather shows that what we need is more liberty, not less. Thanks.